All right, good morning, everybody. Good afternoon, good day, whatever time it is so for you, wherever you're wife. at. I want to invite you to share this periscope by swiping from left to right. I invite you to share this periscope by swiping from left to right. That's if you're on an iOS device. Swipe from left to right. Scroll, click on share via Periscope, Facebook, or Twitter. If you're on an Android device, you can swipe from down to up, down to up. Scroll, click on share. Share via Periscope, via Facebook, via Twitter. All right, and I invite you to do that right now. Hey, what's going on, brother? So I invite you to share this Periscope right now simply by swiping from left to right, left to right, scroll, click on share. You can share via Periscope, Facebook, or Twitter. If you're on an Android device, which I'm assuming a lot of you are, especially you, my fellow friends that are over in the UK, such and such. Hey Israel, how you doing? Scroll from down to up, scroll from down to up, or swipe from down to up, scroll, click on share via Periscope, Facebook, or Twitter. Long time, long time. All right, so. Oh, and you can also copy the URL and drop that URL in the text message. You can drop the URL in a text message, send it in an email, whatever you want to do. All right, so you know it's that time. Let me know where you're at as you're coming in right now. I praise the Lord. All right, so where are we at? Where are we at? Where are we at? Copy the Puerto Rico is here. My email is the number four, then runner777 at gmail.com. Somebody put my email up on the screen for me. Kentucky, D.C., Orlando, Florida, Cleveland, Tennessee, NYC is here, Georgia, Dallas, Claremont, the BX, Bronx, Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, Georgia, Colorado Springs, Houston, Texas, Santa Cruz, California, Toronto, Boston, Mass, Brooklyn, Phoenix, Arizona, Kenya, glad that you're in here, Kenya, Minnesota, Claremont Valley, Eugene, Oregon, Good morning, Niagara, Canada, Michigan, Eastern Kentucky, NC, Colorado Springs, Chattanooga, 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 <laughs> South Africa, Bahamas, Rhode Island. I always like to talk about Rhode Island. Norway, glad that you're here. SAU, see you. Same, you got to get to work while we at work. Um, Salem, Oregon, Dallas, Louisiana. <laughs> Indianapolis, Haiti. Haiti and ATL. I don't even know how to explain that, but okay. Nabule. Jacksonville, Florida. Apopka, Florida. LOL, Religious Liberty. <laughs> Have mercy. I'm high to listen to this. Okay. Um, Los Angeles. Who else is in here? Top I say to my brother, my brother from um, Haiti. Daytona. I'm in a dark closet. Come out. LOL. Okay, okay, everybody. So, everybody, we're in here right now. And as you're coming in, some others have come in. Just want to invite you to share this periscope right now by swiping from left to right. Swipe from left to right. Left to right, scroll. Click on share via Periscope, Facebook, or Twitter. If you're on an Android device, just swipe from down to up, down to up. Scroll, click on share via Periscope, Facebook, or Twitter. Go ahead and do that right now. I just want to give everybody the opportunity to do that. The topic's interesting this morning for certain, and um, something that you might want to share with uh, family members, friends, coworkers, those who name themselves as your enemies. Mm -hmm. Get the message out there. We're going to get into this, all right? But as I always like to do before I get into any of these scopes, you know I like to first start off with a word of prayer, so definitely going to get into a word of prayer before I do anything else. But definitely want to ask everybody, go ahead and just share this periscope by swiping from left to right. I think there were some problems when I, when I, um, when I came on. Swipe down to up? Okay. It's okay. Swipe down to up on Android. Swipe left to right on iOS. Okay, so I have to correct myself. On an Android, you swipe from... Yeah, I just said that. Down to up. <laughs> down to up on an Android. And you get the point. So, anyway, I don't know if this um, automatically posted to my Twitter feed 
because it did, well, obviously it said there were some problems with the posting to my Twitter feed, so it's not going to be up on my Twitter feed. So you guys are the ones that will have to post it up to Twitter. And if you're not a follower on Twitter, I invite you to be a follower on Twitter. I invite you to be a subscriber on YouTube. And I invite you to be a follower on Facebook. And, and of course, I invite you to be a follower here on Periscope. All right, everybody. So I'm going to have a word of prayer. I want to invite you all to reverently bow your heads and close your eyes with me. And definitely invite you to be really interactive in the conversation that we're going to be delving into um, this morning, this afternoon, this evening, whatever time it is for you, wherever you're at, because I know we have people in here from all over the world. So let's just have a word of prayer and ask God to lead and direct as we get into this. Father in heaven, I thank you for the blessed opportunity that we have to gather together from every nation, kindred, tongue, and people from north, south, east, and west. And I'm praying that your Holy Spirit, as I ask every time, will please lead and direct us into all truth. Father, your son Jesus told us, ask, and it shall be given you. Seek and ye shall find, knock, and it shall be opened unto you. And so we come asking, we come seeking, and we pray that you would bless us with that precious gift that we need of the indwelling of your spirit. Not only that we might be strengthened in the inner man so that we might be able to comprehend the breadth, the length, the depth, and the height, and to know the love of Christ, which passes all knowledge, that we might be filled with all the fullness of God, as you said in your word in the book of Ephesians chapter 3. Lord, that we might be used of you to help others come into the knowledge of the truth. Transform us through your word. May this not just be time that we come together to hear information. But Lord, I pray that the truth will sanctify us, even that we might be partakers of eternal life. May we enter into the joy of Jesus Christ, which is to see the souls of men and women saved out of the darkness into this marvelous light. Please hear our cry. May your holy angels come to be with us now, to surround us, to bring light from your throne room, to illuminate our minds, and to lead us forward. This I pray and I thank you, Lord, and I dedicate myself into your hands and we dedicate this time to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay. Title of this scope. The title of this scope is This May Shock You. And it may shock some of you because the things that I'm going to deal with today may shock some of you out there. Some of you out there may have heard some of the things that I've talked about right now. But looking at the number that's in here right now, I know that we have people in here that have never heard what I'm getting ready to say right now. So this may shock you. Oh, yeah, don't forget to take a look at Leprovision. Definitely want to look at Leprovision, by the way, a docufilm that I have on YouTube. You want to look at that, especially after this scope. But um, this may shock you what you're getting ready to hear. I got a friend in here that's doing some work right now. I'm someplace, not in an undisclosed location, but I'm in, the, I'm in, the, I'm in a location that's in this, not totally disclosed to you. <laughs> it's probably going to shock this gentleman over here that hears me talking to you. Because this may shock you if you've never heard what I'm talking about right now. But nonetheless, it's 100% truth. Because that's all we deal with here is truth. All right, so what's, this, what's the deal? Topic of this scope is this may shock you. Mark of the Beast technology is now here. Mark of the Beast technology is now here. Question mark, question mark, question mark. Question mark, question mark, question mark. Okay, if you guys are ready to get into this, are you ready? Tap on the screen, put arts on the screen. Let's see if you're ready. Let's get right into this. If you're ready, let's put it. I'm sorry. Come on, you. And I'm sorry if I'm hyping it up right now, but the thing is, I know that most of you guys out there, praise the Lord, you don't drink coffee. Praise the Lord, you're not on that. You're not on that Coke. You're not on that Coke or that Coke. You're not on that Coke or that Coke, right? So, 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 so I'm just here. I'm here. I'm, I'm here to get you ready for the morning. Get you ready in the morning. Let's get it. We're here to get you ready in the morning and get in the truth, right? All right, all right. Let's go. All right, so let's get right into it. Um, what I'm getting ready to share with you right now is a video clip. I'm going to share with you a video clip from CBS New York. And um, let's get right into it. All right, here we go. Scene at 11. Company developing tech tattoos so people can track their medical and financial info. Scene at 11. Company developing tech tattoos so people can track their medical financial info. CBS New York, let's look at the clip. In the not 
not-so-distant future, you could be wearing all of your personal information, everything from your credit card numbers to your vital signs. It's called the tech tattoo. Forget Fitbit. So this is really going beyond what the fitness tracker is. The latest bio wearable looks like I'm this so proud that gets my embedded onto going. your arm. The tech tattoo you can Sorry about that, guys. Let's run that back. On your skin. Information. The tech tattoo. Forget Fitbit. So this is really going beyond what the fitness tracker is. The latest bio wearable looks like a circuit board that gets embedded onto your arm. With a tech tattoo, you can carry all your information on your skin. Information like your identification and your credit card numbers that can be easily relayed to a smartphone app when you need to use them. We carry wallets around and they're so vulnerable. That Experts say the temporary tat will also be able to monitor your vitals like body temperature, blood pressure, even your stress levels, then transmit this information to a mobile app or computer being monitored by your health professional. If there's an issue, they can call you. 20% of, of Americans, I think, have tattoos, so there is a potential market there. But unlike the tattoos we know today, tech tattoos are not permanent, according to Wired Magazine's Tim Moynihan. It's a lot like henna. They're made with electroconductive ink that contains various sensors and, in some cases, no. tiny microchips. The makers say they will last for up to a year. It's a fascinating idea. While still very much in the experimental stages, some other practical uses for tech tattoos in the future could be helping to track missing children or checking up on soldiers in combat. Now, right now, they wear suits that uh, try and keep track of all their vitals, uh, and then if something goes wrong with the suit, then maybe they have a problem. But if it's on their skin, well, they know all the time. Cosmetic company L'Oreal is also getting in the action with a temporary tattoo that can track UV exposure and alert you if you're in danger of burning. All right. So there it is. Right now, they're developing technology. They have developed this technology, the tech tattoo. And the tech tattoo, the tech tattoo can not only carry your financial info, but the tech tattoo can also, the tech tattoo. Try saying that five times to say it fast, right? The tech tattoo can also be used to help track your vital signs and carry all of your medical information. And I'm sure that when many people saw this, uh, when they saw this released in the news, they said, this is the mark of the beast. This is it. This is the mark of the beast. I'm not taking the tattoo. I'm not taking the tattoo. Just like others, and I've seen some of you very astutely acknowledging the fact that there has been other technology similar to this that has been released for the use of the general populace, such as the RFID check, one of them in the size of a, size of a, a smaller than a grain of rice. And there are people that have this already actually in, implanted in their hands. I've watched a, uh, uh, I read a news article the other day with a gentleman that used it to get through security at the airport. Just put his hand on the sensor and uh, get in through. And people are saying, this is the mark of the beast. This is the mark of the beast. I mean, we have Christians out here that are so serious about not getting the mark of the beast that if they go to Walmart and the amount comes up to $666 or $6.66, that they will immediately grab a piece of bubble gum or anything that is on the side of that counter and put it on the desk so that that tally goes beyond 666 because they do not want to be in any way, shape, form, or fashion connected to the mark. Listen to me, ladies and gentlemen, listen closely. Listen closely. The problem that many of us are having here is this. We're saying, this is the mark of the beast. Ladies and gentlemen, this is not the mark of the beast. Let me move myself here right now because I'm seeing some funny stuff going on. All right, let's do it like that, I'll like have that. This is not the mark of the beast, ladies and gentlemen, all right? This is not the mark of the beast. Listen to me. The reason why many of us have an inaccurate understanding of what the mark of the beast is is because we're all running left and right like quote-unquote chickens with our heads cut off 
trying to figure out what the mark is instead of taking the more intelligent approach in trying to discover what the mark of the beast is by first seeking to determine who the beast is, ladies and gentlemen, because it is the mark of the beast. The mark of the beast. So if the mark is of the beast, doesn't it first make sense to figure out who the beast is before you seek to determine what that beast's mark of authority is? Furthermore, ladies and gentlemen, I want you to take a little, take two seconds to think about this next point, okay? I want you to take two seconds to think about this point, next point. And I know I have some people in the room right now that are like, you know, a little eager. We have to point what it is. It's this. It is this. This is what the mark of the beast is. We must tell you what the mark of the beast is. It is very important for us all to know what the mark of the beast is. But let's just take two seconds to run it down from the scripture before we just slap it up on the screen and say this is what it is. Because automatically, when people hear this is what the mark of the beast is, and they don't understand the premise for which we come to this conclusion to understand what the mark of the beast is, they'll have, people, people tend to resist it. They tend to resist it because you don't understand the premise of understanding what the mark of the beast is. Do you understand what I'm saying? If everybody just understood, if you understand what I just said, just tap on the screen, put hearts on the screen and say yes. And please, uh, forgive me if I'm being a little bit animated and all of this stuff, you know, I'm just trying to, trying to help you out right now. I'm trying to help you out right now. Okay, so let's get, let's get this, let's get this. I want to ask you a question. Watch this. The Bible says in the book, I want you to think with me. The Bible says in the book of Revelation chapter 14 and verse 9, And the third angel follows, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast or his image, if any man worship the beast or his image and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into his cup of indignation. So what's the result of receiving the mark of the beast? Answer, you will receive the untempered wrath of God. You will receive the untempered wrath of God. What is the untempered wrath of God? The Bible says in the book of Revelation chapter 16 and verse 1, And I saw another sign in heaven, great and marvelous, seven angels having the seven last plagues, for in them is filled up the wrath of God. So those that receive the mark of the beast will receive the untempered wrath of God. The untempered wrath of God is the seven last plagues. Now you can see what some of these plagues are. If you look in the book of Revelation, it's very fearful. We're talking about boils all over your body, drinking blood for water, very fearful stuff. Now I want you to think about this. If the mark of the beast was something as simple as a microchip being stuffed under your skin or a tattoo being placed on your body, by the way, it's directly connected to worship as it said in Revelation chapter 14 and verse 9 because it said there, if any man worship the beast in his image and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand. So the mark of the beast is directly connected to worship. Question, I want to see if everybody follows this. Follows this. What is the mark of the beast directly connected to? Put the answer on the screen, everybody. What's the mark of the beast directly connected to? Please put the answer on the screen if you know what it is. Worship. Put the word worship on the screen. Worship, 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 worship. Okay. Okay, worship, worship, mm -hmm. worship. Very good, very good, very good. Now I want you to think about this. If the mark of the beast was directly connected, is direct, because we know the mark of the beast is directly connected to worship. And if you receive the mark of the beast, you receive the untempered wrath of God. If it was just as something, if it was just something as simple as putting a microchip under someone's skin or a tattoo on someone's arm or leg or forehead. Then ladies and gentlemen, that means that the police could run into your house, pin you down on the ground, handcuff you, and then stick a needle in your arm, putting a microchip in your body, and you've received the mark of the beast, and God is going to send you, and God is going to burn you, and give you the punishment of the seven last plagues because a group of men were, over, were, a group of men were able to overpower you and stick a microchip in you. Does that sound like God? Do you think God is going to judge you because of the works of other men? So you mean to tell me God is going to give me the plagues because 10 men more powerful than me were able to pin me down and stick a microchip in me or put, or put a, 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 a 
temporary tattoo on me? Are you trying to see? Now, I'm, I'm taking the time to deal with this right now because I want you to consider how utterly illogical it is for us to believe that the mark of the beast is connect, or the mark of the beast is a microchip, is an ID card, is a tattoo. These are things that people can force on you. Are you with me so far? If you understand what I've just said right now, tap on the screen, put hearts on the screen, or say yes. And the reason I'm taking it from this route, because basically, just appealing to your common sense, I want you to see how illogical the, I guess, I guess, I want you to see how illogical what the majority of Christianity actually holds to be true concerning the mark of the beast. It doesn't make any sense. Okay? Worship, ladies and gentlemen, is something that is consensual. Worship, some, worship is something that is given through the exercise of one's conscience. Therefore, the reception of the mark of the beast has, some, has to be something that someone receives due to consensual I mean, you, you already get what I'm getting. It, ha it has to be consensual. They have to, it has to be a decision that they make. And that's that simple. Does everybody get that? Do you get that? All right, I'm gonna, and I'm gonna back up off of this in a second and get real serious with this as we get into the Bible. But I want to deal with this point. Sometimes, you know, it's just like Elijah when he was on Mount Carmel and the, and, the, and the prophets of Baal were jumping around, cutting themselves, slashing themselves and doing all these things to try to have Baal send fire down. And Elisha said, maybe you, need to, maybe you need to scream louder. Maybe you need to scream louder. Maybe you need to cut yourself some more. Maybe Baal is sleeping. Maybe Baal is sleeping. Baal, probably watched, Baal, Baal was probably up late last night watching um, um, Hip Hop and Love. He was probably up last night watching House of Cards. You have to wake Baal up, man. Wake Baal up. Wake Bell up. I'm sure, he just, I'm sure he's just on a phone call right now. And that's what I'm basically trying to appeal to you right now. This is, this, is exactly what I'm, this is exactly what I'm trying to do, is appeal to you the folly, the folly of actually accepting that belief system. It doesn't make any sense. So let's get to the truth of the matter. First of all, let's define who the beast is from the Bible. In the book of Revelation, Revelation chapter 13 and verse 1, the Bible says that John stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast rising up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and upon its horns ten crowns, and upon its heads the names of blasphemy. So John sees a beast rising out of the sea, having seven heads, ten horns, Ten crowns upon the horns, upon the heads, the name of blasphemy. Now, if you open your Bible to the book of Daniel, chapter 7 and verse 2. What Bible scripture did I say? Daniel 7 and verse 2. The Bible says, Daniel spake and said, I saw in my vision by the night, and behold, the four winds of the heaven strove upon the great sea, and four great beasts came up out of the sea, diverse one from another. If you look in Daniel chapter 7 and verse 17, Daniel begins to break down what a beast is in Bible prophecy. In Daniel 7, 17, the Bible says, These great beasts, which are four, are four kings which shall arise out of the earth. In Daniel 7 and verse 23, the Bible says, Thus he said, the fourth beast shall be the fourth kingdom upon the earth. So a beast in Bible prophecy is a symbol of a kingdom, a political power. A civil power. If you understand what I've just shared with you from the Bible, tap on the screen, put hearts on the screen. Tell me what a beast is in Bible prophecy according to Daniel chapter 7, verses 2 and 3. Daniel chapter 7, verse 17. Daniel chapter 7, and verse 23. What is a beast in Bible prophecy? A nation. Very good. Give me another name. Kingdom. Very good. Give me another name. Come on. Come on. Let's move it. Talk to me. Talk to me. Talk to me. Talk to me. Kingdom. 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 Okay. Very good. So it's a kingdom, a political power. Now, a power, I like that, but in particular, political power. Very good. Political power, kingdom, civil power, nation, any of those will do. Any of those will be suitable. Now, if you go back to Dan Revelation chapter 13 and verse 1, you'll note that this kingdom has upon its foreheads, the heads rather, the name of blasphemy. Now, the book of Revelation is very symbolic. When you see a name or a title um, across the name, across the head of an entity, 
It's because that name, that name is symbolic of the character of the entity that that name is embossed on, so to say. So in other words, this political power has the name of blasphemy on it because it's a political power that blasphemes. Does that make sense? This political power has the name of blasphemy or the names of blasphemy on its forehead in Revelation 13 and verse 1 because this is a political power, a kingdom that blasphemes. Does everybody understand that? Tap on the screen, put hearts on the screen, say yes. Or say, or tap on the screen, put hearts on the screen, say yes. I just want all of you to get this, okay? I don't know why you guys are so anxious to go before everything. Take your time, take your time. We're going to put everything point by point. I know I got some scholars in here with me, but we know... It, it, you know, I was taught before, I was taught before in the streets, you jab, you jab, you jab before you throw. That's how you throw combinations. You jab, you jab, you jab, and then you throw the uppercut. Jab, 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 you know what I'm saying? Jab, then you jab, you get what I'm saying? So we got to jab right now. So we're jabbing right now. We're doing with everything point by point. Let's jab. So we're taking our time and dealing with the information in its sequential order. So a political power, a political power is symbolized as a kingdom. Political power is symbolized as a kingdom. This kingdom has upon its foreheads the name blasphemy. This kingdom has upon its foreheads the name blasphemy, which means that we're looking at a political power. We're looking at a nation, a political power that blasphemes. Now, when you think of the term blasphemy, do you think of church or do you think of state? When you think of blasphemy, do you think of nation? Do you think of political power, civil power, or do you think of religion? Which one do you think of when you think of blasphemy? Religion or you think of political? Okay, very good. I know my people are walking with me now. Church, 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 religion, religion, religion. Perfect. Because the title, the name blasphemy has very specific religious connotations associated with it. So let's find out what blasphemy is defined as in the Bible. Let's start in the book of Mark chapter 2 and verse 7. In Mark chapter 2 and verse 7, all right, Jesus had healed a man and he said, My son, thy sins be forgiven thee. This is in the book of Mark chapter 2 and verse 7. Now, I want to, well, that, he didn't say my son... My son, thy sins be forgiven thee in Mark 2 and verse 7. He says it in the book of Mark chapter 2. A scribe now, hearing Jesus forgive a man of his sins in Mark chapter 2 and verse 7 says this. Why doth this man thus speak blasphemies? Who can forgive sin but God only? According to the Bible, God and God alone has the ability to forgive sin. And if a man claims the prerogative of God or claims the ability of God to be able to exonerate or forgive another man of his sins, this man is committing the act of blasphemy. So if a man professes that he can forgive another man of his sin, that is the act of blasphemy. Did everybody get that? Tap your screen, put hearts on the screen, say yes. We're almost there. 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 Okay, so we're almost there. So if you say you can forgive another man of his sin, what is that? It's blasphemy. Okay, so let's take it to another scripture now. Go to the book of John chapter 10 and verse 33. John chapter 10 and verse 33. John 10 and verse 33. And don't, don't mind the handwork. I'm just, I'm just using this to illustrate what we're trying to do right now, right? Don't mind the handwork. So in John 10 and verse 33. In John 10 and verse 33. In John 10 and verse 33, it says this. In the book of John, chapter 10 and verse 33, the Pharisees were getting ready. The Pharisees were getting ready to stone Jesus. And they said to him, for good work, we stone thee not, but for blasphemy. And because thou, being a man, makest thyself God. Listen to what they said. Blasphemy is when a man sets himself up in the position of God. That's John, chapter 10 and verse 33. If a man sets himself up, up in the place of God, that is the act of blasphemy, ladies and gentlemen. That is the act of blasphemy. If you understand that point, tap on the screen, put hearts on the screen, say yes. By the way, do you know that the Bible actually, do you know that the Bible actually prophesied that there would be a change that would take place within the Christian church? And this change that took place within the Christian church would actually bring into existence a man that would do just that? set himself up in the place of God and profess himself to be God himself on earth, the Bible declares it in the book of 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. 
In 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, beginning at verse 3. Yes, it does. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, beginning at verse 3. This is what the Apostle Paul said. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, beginning at verse 3. Speaking of the second coming of Jesus Christ, the Apostle Paul said this. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come. Speaking of the second coming of Jesus Christ, except there come a falling away first stop. The phrase falling away means apostasy. In other words, the second coming of Jesus Christ would not take place until there was a massive movement of error that took place in the church. Many people that were walking in the light of truth would begin to step off the platform of truth. They would apostatize. They would go from error, go from, go from truth rather into error, from light into darkness. And as a result of that, the Bible goes on to say, and I want to start again. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come except there come a falling away first. Listen closely. And that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, who exalteth himself, who exalteth himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Did you hear that? This man of sin, this son of perdition, meaning, meaning that this man is committed to destruction, he would set himself up in a position where he, where he would exalt himself above all that is called God or that is worship, so that he would actually put himself in the position of God to other men, saying, I am God on earth. Now, ladies and gentlemen, history lesson time, history lesson time, history lesson time. You tell me of any kingdom in the Bible that blasphemes, stop. For a kingdom or a political power to blaspheme, this means that this is a religious power that is not, excuse me, this is a political power that's not just political. I'm talking about Revelation 13 and verse 1 and 2. It's a political power that's not just political because blasphemy, you got it right. Because blasphemy, blasphemy is not a political term it's a religious term so we're looking at a political power that has united with the church we're looking at a union of church and state in one ladies and gentlemen so we're looking at a system that unites church and state in one and exalts a man or men to the position of God and these men profess to have the ability to forgive other men of their sin tell me you know, I, I, don't have to, I don't have to hit the one because we, we already hit that already. Tell me, you name any other system or entity in existence on earth that fits that bill other than the Roman Catholic Church led out by the papacy, led out by the Pope. It is a religious political entity. The Pope is like, the Pope is supposed to, that's why they call him the Holy Father, don't they? The Holy Father? Who said he's the Holy Father? Jesus said, call no, man, call no man father. Ladies and gentlemen, it's the Roman Catholic Church. And do they not say they can forgive other men of their sin? Don't tell me they don't. Because then I didn't go to Catholic school then. Because I remember when I went to those Catholic schools. And it was time for the confessional booth. Them brothers were telling you to say Hail Marys, rub the beads, and do all these things. So that you can be forgiven of your sins. This is all, this is all blasphemous. And the Bible said that the Roman Catholic Church is the beast of Bible prophecy that is being identified in Revelation chapter 13, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, and 8. So when we're talking about the mark of the beast, what are we talking about? We are talking about the mark of of authority of the Roman Catholic Church. We are talking about the mark of the authority of the Roman Catholic Church. I want you to see something. We are looking at the power that is called Antichrist. If you understand this, tap on the screen, put hearts on the screen, ladies and gentlemen. I'm gonna show you something right now. I'm gonna show you something right now that you may never have considered before, and I hope it just sits into your brain real quick. All right. Did everybody get that? How many of this is how many of you out there is this new for? If this is new for you, put the letter N on the screen. Let me put it like this. If this is new for you and you get it, put the letter N on the screen and the number one next to it. That's a better one. That's why you give me two answers in once. If this is new for you, 
and you understand that what you've just heard is truth, put the letter N on the screen and put the one next to it. Good. I see one N and one. Give me another one. Give me another one. One up. All right. Give me another one. N and one. Come on. Where else is it? I know, I know there's some other people in there this is new for. <laughs> N one. Good. If what's new, what you're hearing right now. Good, you understand. Everybody gets old and new. Good, everybody understands. And in one. Okay, good, 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 good. Okay, so let's take it one step further, right? Let's take it one step further. I want you to see this. And I'm going to... Yeah, this is me. That's right. JD, JD Deception guy. That's right. Okay, let's take it one step further. In the end, okay, because I'm going to show you what the mark of the beast is. But I want you to see something really clear. Okay, I understand that you're wrestling with it. That's perfect. This next point is going to really help you, okay? Listen closely. You ready? In the end, there is a controversy concerning worship. Watch this. If you look in Revelation chapter 14, verses 6 and 7, this is what the Bible says. And I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell in the earth, and to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to him. Why? For the hour of his judgment is come, and worship him that made the heaven and the earth, the sea, and the fountains of water. Don't miss that last point. So, the first angel's message is worship God. Okay? And who's this God? Him that created the heavens, the earth, the sea, and the fountains of water. Don't miss that point. Third angel's message, Revelation 14 and verse 9. And the third angel followed, saying, If any man worship the beast, if any man worships the beast and his image and receives his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into his cup of indignation. Stop. So notice that there's two opposing systems of worship. Number one, the worship of the one that created the heavens and the earth, the sea and the fountains of water. That's the worship of the living God. Number two, the worship of the beast in Revelation 14 and verse 9. Or is everybody getting this right now? If you get this, tap on the screen, put hearts on the screen, say yes. I'm going to take this. I'm going to take this just like this. I'm about to hit you with the mark, but I want you to see how you can know that what I'm telling you is not just something off the top of my head, but it's truth. All right? I want you to see that it's truth. That's why I'm taking the time to do this. Okay? Now catch this next point. That's this next point. Follow closely. Okay, so you see it's both. Now, let's deal with the first true worship, which is the worship of the one that made the heavens, the earth, the sea, and the fountains of water. Who is the one that made the heavens, the earth, the sea, and the fountains of water, according to the Bible? Who is the one that made the heavens, the earth, the sea, and the fountains of water, according to the Bible? Say, we say, God, Jesus, very good, God, Jesus, God, Jesus, God, Jesus. Okay, God, Jesus. Okay, God, Jesus. Okay. Don't get stuck. We're going to make this real clear. Now watch this. We're going to look at one scripture right now. Exodus chapter 20, beginning at verse 8. Look what it says. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work. But the seventh day, seventh, the seventh day, which we call Saturday, the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not do any work, thou nor thy son nor thy daughter, thy manservant nor thy maidservant nor thy cattle, nor thy stranger that is within thine gates. For in six days the Lord made the heaven and the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that in them is stopped and rested on the seventh day. Wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. Did you notice some information in the fourth commandment of Exodus chapter 20 and verse 8 that sounds directly like the message in Revelation chapter 14 and verse 7? Listen to what it said there. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea, and all that in them is, and rested on the seventh day. Wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. Revelation 14 and verse 7 said, And worship him that made the heavens and the earth, the sea, and the fountains of water. Do you see how the message that is connected to the worship that God calls us to enter into on the Sabbath day 
is actually spoken of in Revelation 14 and verse 9, saying, Worship him that made the heavens and earth, is seen the fountains of water. So the Bible is saying that we should worship the Lord of Sabbath. The Bible is saying we should worship the Lord of Sabbath, ladies and gentlemen. Did you get that point? If you got that point, say yes. If you got that point, say yes. Tap on the screen. Say yes. Tap on the screen. Put hearts on the screen. Okay, I want to give you another point. I'm going to give you another point. Give you another point. The Sabbath, ladies and gentlemen, stands as a memorial of creation. And it stands as a memorial of who the Creator is. Say it again. You see that right there in Exodus 20 and verse 8 and 9, that the Sabbath stands, the Seventh-day Sabbath, seventh Sabbath stands as a memorial of creation and a memorial of who the Creator is. Even in the book of Genesis chapter 2, verses 2 and 3, the Bible says, And on the seventh day God ended His work, His work which He had made, and He rested on the seventh day from all His work which God created and made. And God blessed the Sabbath, Sabbath day and sanctified it. Why? Because that in it he had rested from all his work which God created and made. So he pronounced a special blast blessing on the Sabbath. He sanctified, meaning set, he set aside the Sabbath for a holy special use because he wanted it to stand as a memorial that he rested on the seventh day from all his work which he created and made. And it was by his creative power that he did this thing. Okay. That is... And I want to point out one more thing. Are you ready? Are you ready? One more thing. Did everybody follow that so far? That the, st the Sabbath stands as a memorial of who the Creator is and of His work of creation. Seventh day Sabbath. Did everybody get that point? Tap on the screen, put hearts on the screen and say yes. I'm going to wait before I hit to the next point. For my, for my people, that is the first time that you heard this. Just put N1. That way I know that you understand what, this, what I just said. And one, first time hearing this, if, if it makes sense to you, put N and one. N and one. Okay, good, 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 good. Okay, here's the next point now. Here's the next point now. Guess who the Lord of Sabbath is? Mark chapter 2, verse 27 and 28. Mark chapter 2, verses 27 and 28. This is what it says in Mark 2, verse 27 and 28. This is what it says here. The Sabbath was made for man and not man for the Sabbath. Stop. The Sabbath was made for man, meaning that God made the Sabbath for our benefit. How so? Because it is to remind us of who the Creator is and of His creative work and give us the opportunity to rest and enjoy communion with Him. The Sabbath was made for man. It was made for our benefit and not man for the Sabbath. Now look what it goes on to say. Jesus said, Therefore, the Son of Man, which is Jesus Christ, therefore, the Son of Man is Lord also of the Sabbath. Who's Lord of Sabbath? Who's the Lord of Sabbath? Who's the Lord of Sabbath? Everybody put on the screen who the Lord of Sabbath is. God. But in particular, who is, giving, who is speaking those words? The Son of Man. Who is the Son of Man? Jesus is the Son of Man. Thank you very much. Jesus is the Son of Man. Jesus is the Son of Man. So Jesus is the Lord of Sabbath. Jesus is the Lord of Sabbath. Very good. So ladies and gentlemen, Jesus Christ is the Lord of Sabbath. So watch this now. Watch this now. Mark chapter 2, I mean Ezekiel chapter 20 and verse 12. Because I'm about to show you what the mark of the beast is after these two scriptures. Ezekiel chapter 20 and verse 12. Ezekiel chapter 20 and verse 12. I'm just taking you through this so that you can see the point. See, because if, if you don't understand the full scope of the issue many times, it's hard for you to, to grasp this topic. Ezekiel chapter 20 and verse 12. Ezekiel chapter 20 and verse 12. This is what the Bible says in Ezekiel 20 and verse 12. Moreover, also I gave them my Sabbath to be a sign between me and them that they might know that I am the Lord that does sanctify them. Notice that the Bible says that the Sabbath is a sign. Did everybody get that? That the Sabbath is a sign. If you got that, tap on the screen, put hearts on the screen, say yes. As a matter of fact, tell me, what is the Sabbath? The Sabbath is a sign. Put the word sign on the screen for Sabbath. I'm only asking you to put the word sign on the screen for Sabbath so that you just have these things in your mind that you know. Okay, good. And, and, and first point is, is, is that it's a sign 
that God is the one that sanctifies us. So when you keep the Sabbath by faith, you are acknowledging by faith that Jesus is the one that sanctifies you. Jesus, the Lord of Sabbath, is the one that makes you holy. Okay? And by the way, the word sign can also mean mark. So notice that God has his mark of authority. And what is it? The Sabbath. Okay. Look at Ezekiel 20 and verse 20. Ezekiel 20 and verse 20. It says, And hollow my Sabbath, and they shall be a sign between me and you, that you might know that I am the Lord your God. So, when you keep the Sabbath by faith in Jesus Christ, you are acknowledging that Jesus is the Lord of your life. You're acknowledging that you believe that it was the Word of God, Jesus Christ, that created all things. And because the Word of God, Jesus Christ, is your Creator, He is the one that is worthy of your homage, your worship, your service, your hearts, your heart's affections, your greatest... Im you get the point right now. You get the point. So all these people that think the Sabbath draws away from Christ, according to the Bible, the Sabbath points us to Christ. The Sabbath points us to Christ as our Lord and our God. The Sabbath points us to Christ as the one that makes us holy. Now somebody said here, sinners celebrate one day, but the Sabbath should be every day. The Bible doesn't say that. The Bible says that the Sabbath is a singular day. Listen closely, my friend. We are to worship God in spirit and in truth every day. Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, which is the Sabbath day. Worship God in spirit and in truth. But listen, God set aside, He blessed, He sanctified one particular day. In other words, this day is special for us and God. It's, I want you to think of it as a, uh, an anniversary, because that's what it is. I want you to think of it as an anniversary, as a date between you and God. This is the special time that God says, you know what, on this day, I don't want you to be focused on secular labor. On this day, I want you to just focus on your relationship with me. And you can also focus on your relationship with me by loving others, helping others, be kind to others. So we're to follow God's commandments every day, of course, because we have breath every day. We're to worship God every day. Why? Because every day we're supposed to give glory to God. But there is only one day that God set aside he sanctified. If God blessed it and sanctified it, that means there's something special about it. And you can never not, and you can never make it common. It's not common. The Sabbath is a special sacred day. It is God's sign. And when you keep it, when you honor it by faith, you are honoring Jesus as the Lord of your life. You are honoring the fact that you believe that Jesus is the only one that can make you holy. And that if you did any good works, on Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, or Friday, or Saturday, any good work that you've done, it is only because of Christ working in you. That's what it says. He's, it's the sign that he's the one that sanctifies us. Do you understand that point? Tap on the screen, put arts on the screen, say yes if you understand that point. Because I'm want i trying to help you guys get to something here. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm trying to help you get the point. The Sabbath is God's special sign between us and him to help us remember who our God is, to help us remember who makes us holy, to help us remember that He loves us, that's why He made us. Now, in the Bible, there is a power that is called Antichrist. There is a power that is called Antichrist. Have you ever heard of Antichrist before? Say yes if you've heard of Antichrist before. Tap on the screen, say yes. Okay. Do you know what the phrase Antichrist means? What does the phrase Antichrist mean? Tell me what the phrase Antichrist means. Okay, counterfeit, very good. Very good. Now, see, somebody's saying against God, and most of us, we think Antichrist means against God. But do you know that the phrase Antichrist does not simply mean against God, but it means to set up in the place of God? Did you know that's what Antichrist means? To set up in the place of God? That's what Antichrist means, to set up in the place of Christ. Ladies and gentlemen, the Antichrist system is not just opposed to God, but it opposes God by trying to set itself up in God's place. That's how it opposes God. 
it opposes God by trying to subvert God's authority by placing itself in the position of God's authority. And what we looked at in the book of 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 3 and 4, is that power. Listen to what it said there. Listen closely. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, for, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first. Listen, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, who exalteth himself above all that is called God or that is worship. So you see this power that's exalting itself against God or that's in opposition to God. But then look what it says next. Who setteth himself up? Listen who exalted himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Notice this power that opposes Christ, that opposes God, is also trying to set itself up in the position of God. That is Antichrist. And who did we determine that that system was earlier? It is the Pope of the Roman Catholic Church. The Pope that leads out the papacy of the Roman Catholic Church. The Pope that is the head of the Roman Catholic Church. Ladies and gentlemen, the Pope is the Antichrist power of Bible prophecy. The Roman Catholic Church is the Antichrist of Bible prophecy. What's the point? If this system is simply trying to set itself up in the position of Christ, then it counterfeits the work of the true and living God. So, if the mark or the sign of the true and living God is his holy seventh day Sabbath, which he has called us to worship him, that is the creator of the heavens and the earth, the sea and the fountains of water. Then we must know that the Antichrist system has set up its own false day of worship, ladies and gentlemen. It has set up its own false day of worship to counterfeit the sign that was established by God himself. If you understand that point, tap on the screen, put arts on the screen. If this is the first time you heard it, if you get the logic, put the letters, put N1 on the screen. If you understand the logic, we find what I'm trying to share with you. And then I'm going to show you some evidence right now. Put N1 on the screen if this is the first time you heard it and you understand the logic. Good. Okay. Good. All right. Now, let's prove it. Let's, I'm going to show you from the mouth of the beast himself what they have to say concerning Sunday worship. Look at this. Is that clear? Can everybody see this clear right now? Is this clear right now? Can everybody see it clearly? Say yes if you can see this clearly. Okay. James Cardinal Gibbons, I'm going to put it this way so you can see it even better because, nah, I'm going to put it back this way because you guys are going to put comments on the screen crazy anyhow. James Cardinal Gibbons, The Faith of Our Fathers, 88th edition, page 89. But you may read the Bible from Genesis to Revelation and you will not find a single line authorizing the sanctification of Sunday. The scriptures enforce the religious observance of Saturday, a day which we never sanctify. Who? The Roman Catholic Church doesn't sanctify. They are letting you know that they're responsible for Sunday actually being acknowledged within the realms, realms of Christianity as a day of worship. Stephen Keenan, A Doctrinal Catechism, 3rd edition, page 174. Question. Have you any other way of proving that the church has power to institute festivals or precepts? They're talking about the Roman Catholic Church when they say church. Answer. Had she not such power, she could not have done that in which all modern religionists, religionists agree with her. She could not have substituted the observance of Sunday, the first day of the week, for the observance of Saturday, the seventh day a day for which there is no scriptural authority. They are letting you know that Sunday has no scriptural, scriptural authority. It has no biblical authority. Sunday is a substitute that was set up by the Antichrist power, the Roman Catholic Church, in opposition to God's sign, his mark of authority, Sabbath, the seventh day. Here we go again. John Lux. A course in religion for Catholic high schools and academic academies. Bring it up a little higher. 
Some theologians have held that God likewise directly determined the Sunday as the day of worship in the new law, that he himself has explicitly substituted the Sunday for the Sabbath. But this theory is now entirely abandoned. It is now commonly held that God simply gave his church the power to set aside whatever day or day she would deem suitable as holy days. The church chose Sunday. Every time they use the term church, no, they're talking about the Roman Catholic Church. The church chose Sunday, the first day of the week, and in the course of time added other days as holy days. Sunday is an institution of man, not an institution of God, ladies and gentlemen. That is blasphemy because this is man trying to make himself God. Daniel Ferez, Education Manual of Christian Doctrine, 1916. These are all Catholic scholars. Question, how prove you that the church hath power to command feasts and holy days? Answer, by the very act of changing the Sabbath into Sunday. Now listen to this. All of you, my friends here, that are evangelicals, that go to church on Sunday right now, I'm, I'm trying to put you onto the truth right now. I want you to be put onto the truth right now. Check this one out. You can definitely find one. Listen to this. Listen to this. Because they're about to slap all Protestants in their faces on this statement. And Protestants, ladies and gentlemen, are every, Catholic, every Christian denomination that believes in the Bible as the word of God. Listen to this. Answer. By the very fact of changing the Sabbath into Sunday, which Protestants, which Protestants allow of, and therefore they fondly contradict themselves by keeping Sunday strictly and breaking most other feasts commanded by the same church. Do you see what they're saying? They're saying, listen, as a Protestant, if you're keeping Sunday, you're contradicting your own belief that you believe in the Bible and the Bible only because the Bible doesn't teach that Sunday is a day of worship. Is the, excuse me, that Sunday is God's Sabbath day. The Bible teaches that Saturday is the Sabbath. When you keep Sunday, you are acknowledging, they are saying, beside yourself, the authority of the Roman Catholic Church to institute commandments. Listen, you don't have to like it. But you have to deal with the truth because it's truth and it's right here, right in front of your face. Sunday worship is not based on the Bible, has nothing to do with the scriptures. It's Saturday, listen, it's James Cardinal Gibbons, Archbishop of Baltimore, 1877, 1921, in a signed letter. Listen to this. Is Saturday the seventh day according to the Bible and the Ten Commandments? I answer yes. Is Sunday the first day of the week? And did the church change the seventh day Saturday? For Sunday, the first day, I answer yes. Did Christ change the day? I answer no. This man is straight up telling you, the Sabbath has never changed from the seventh day Saturday. The change from the seventh day Saturday to the first day Sunday was not done by Christ, it was done by the Roman Catholic Church. Bottom line, period, it's a fact. Everybody, if you understand what you're seeing right now, tap on the screen, put hearts on the screen. If this is the first time you've ever seen this, first time you've ever learned this, but you can see the truth of it, put the letter, put N1 on the screen right now. Put N1 on the screen right now. If this is the first time you've seen this, but you see that it's truth, put N1 on the screen right now. I'm just trying to share with you facts. That's all I'm sharing is facts. I have not given you my own opinion. All I've given you is the Bible, and I'm giving you historical facts. That's it. This is the first time you've seen this before and heard this. N1, good, I'm glad that you see. Anyone else? N1 if you get it first time, okay? Anyone else? Good, I see you see, okay. Let's take it one step further. All right, I'm just gonna take, I'm just taking it step by step. That's all I wanna do. It's all I believe in. Because I know that all of us are here because we like, we love truth. That's the one thing I love about people that come on these scopes. Love about the people that watch the YouTube channel, love about the people that come on my Twitter feed, love about the people that come on my Facebook, because you're all about truth. It's all you're about, and that's what I love. Okay, Catholic, um, by the way, this website is biblesabbath.org, biblesabbath.org, that's the website right there. 
You can get this information from all types of places, by the way. I actually just pulled this website up randomly because I know of several different websites that do with this information that just have the history there. So I just pulled up the first one that I knew had the history there. All right, here's another one. Here is another one. The Catholic Mirror, official pub publication of James Cardinal Gibbons, September 23rd, 1893. The Catholic Church, by virtue of her divine mission, changed the day from Saturday to Sunday. There it is, ladies and gentlemen, their own words. The Catholic Church, by virtue of her divine mission, changed the day from Sunday, fr changed the day from Saturday to Sunday. There it is. There it is. There it is. It's there, black and white. Do I need to give you another one? Do I need to give you any more? Of the beast. The question is, what is the mark of the beast? What is the mark of the sign of the authority of the Roman Catholic Church? Because we've already been able to determine that the beast is the Roman Catholic Church. The mark of the beast, ladies and gentlemen. The mark of the beast, ladies and gentlemen, is none other than Sunday worship that will be legislated into law. When Sunday worship, listen, Sunday, 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 is a tradition that was established by the Roman Catholic Church. Look at what Constantine the Great did in 321 AD, establishing the very first national Sunday law requiring everybody within the Roman Empire to rest on Sunday, ladies and gentlemen. 321 AD, Constantine the Great did that. Listen to me. When Sunday is legislated as a day of rest, we will be steering down the nostrils of the mark of the beast. But right now, Sunday still stands as the mark of the beast's authority. And we will be dealing with the mark of the beast crisis, which is spoken of in the Bible, that if you do not receive it, you will not be able to buy nor sell. Save he that had the mark of the beast, the name of the beast, or the number of his name. You will be looking at that issue in its fullness when Sunday is legislated as a day of rest. And the movement is already afoot to bring Sunday into a position of prominence that it will be acknowledged as a day that needs to be set aside for rest, not only for Christians, but for all society in general. And guess what? They're going to use climate change to help push it as well. They're going to use the immorality that's in society right now to push it. They're going to use the gun violence that's taking place right now in our world to push it. Ladies and gentlemen, they're, using, they're going to use the terrorism issue to push it. You're correct, Jesus rose on Sunday. Jesus rested in the grave on the seventh day. He even, in, even in the grave, Jesus honored the Sabbath. See, Jesus rose on Sunday, but he never gave a commandment that we should now honor Sunday as the special day of rest. Matter of fact, to commemorate his death and resurrection, Jesus gave us what he calls the Lord's Supper, the taking, the taking of the broken bread and of the unfermented grape juice. That is what we are to do in memorial of Jesus' death and resurrection. And if you tell me I'm wrong, tell me exactly where I'm wrong, and I would love to correct myself wherever I'm wrong. Because my friends, there is not one scripture in the Bible that identifies Sunday as being, tra Sunday as being God's new day that we should be acknowledging as the Sabbath. Matter of fact, for those of you out there that didn't know it, know it, do you know that God still, God commanded Sabbath worship on the seventh day in the New Testament? When I say the New Testament, I'm talking about in the book of Hebrews. We're talking about, we're almost in the book of Revelation when I say the book of Hebrews. Do you know that God says that we are to return to the seventh day rest, which is his Sabbath day in the book of Hebrews? Book of Hebrews chapter 4. For my friend that says, I'm wrong. Hebrews chapter 4, I'm going to take you right there. I'm never going to get better. Because I'm going to keep talking and talking and talking. I'm never going to let my voice rest. Hebrews chapter 4. Hebrews chapter 4, listen to this. Hebrews chapter 4. 
Hebrews chapter 4, beginning at verse 1. It says, Let us therefore fear, lest a promise being left us of entering into his rest, any of you should seem to come short of it. For unto us was the gospel preached, as well as unto them. But the word preached did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. Listen to this now. For we which believed to enter into rest, as he said, as I have sworn in my wrath, if they shall enter into my rest, although the works were finished from the foundation of the world. Now listen closely to verse 4. For he spake in a certain place of the seventh day, the seventh day. Which day? Which day did he speak in a certain place of, ladies and gentlemen? Which day? In Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 4. For, matter of fact, I want to put the scripture on the screen. I got to put the scripture on the screen. Because you need to see this with your own eyes. Let's look at right here. I got to put this right here on the screen so you can see it for yourself. Let's get it. Let's look at it right from the Bible. For he spake. Here it is. For he spake in a certain place. Uh, let me put it like this so you can see it in clear. There you go. For he spake in a certain place of the seventh day which day of the seventh day on this wise and god did rest the seventh day from all his works and in this place again which place the seventh day ladies and gentlemen and in this place again if they shall enter into my rest seeing therefore it remaineth that some must enter therein and they to whom it was first preached entered not in because of unbelief ladies and gentlemen the early church they had meetings on sunday they did not keep sunday as the sabbath day don't contradict your own bibles my friend i want you to understand i know it jostles your mind i know it goes against everything for many of you that you've ever known. But what you are having to understand right now is you, the majority of Christendom, is just following after a tradition that was implemented by men and it is wholly not biblical. And if you want the truth, it's right here in the Bible. Question, watch this. If Jesus changed, now watch this. I'm going to... To my beloved friend, to my beloved friend, that just made a statement and said the early church began to rest on Sundays. Are you suggesting that Jesus changed the rest day from the seventh day to the first day? Are you suggesting that? How many of you believe that Jesus changed the rest day from the seventh day? His matter of fact, let me make it clear. How many of you believe that Jesus changed the Sabbath from the seventh day to the first day? How many of you here believe that? If you believe that, put the number one on the screen, all right? This is not, by the way, this is not debate or argumentation, all right, at all. Okay? You can put the number one on the screen, don't, and even if everybody else, even if 99% of the room in here is not with you, still be honest about what your belief is, and nobody attack people, all right, because this is not about attacking, this is about truth, all right? But I know I have at least one or two in here that believe that God changed, all right? I know there's one or two people in this room right now that believe that God changed, that Jesus himself changed. Okay, there we have one. Good, I'm God, you're honest. Okay, so Mark believes it. That, that, that Jesus changed the Sabbath from the seventh day to the first day after his resurrection. Now, I want you to see what the scripture says. Going back to Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 4. For he spake in a certain place of the seventh day on this wise... And God did rest the seventh day from all his works. Again in this place again, if, if they shall enter, hold on. Again in this place again, if they shall enter into my rest. Seeing therefore it remaineth that some must enter therein. And they to whom it was first preached entered not in because of unbelief. Now listen to this. Again he limiteth a certain day. Saying in David today, after so long a time. As it, was, as, it was, as it is said today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts. Listen to this. For if Jesus had given them rest, 
then he would not afterward have spoken of another day. There remaineth therefore a rest to the people of God. Jesus changed anything. There remains a rest for the people of God. And he said, there are many that have not entered therein as of yet. The ones to whom it was first preached didn't enter in. And why didn't they enter in? Because of unbelief. That's what I've been telling you the whole time. To keep the Sabbath, you must do so by faith. Faith in the Lord as the one that can make you holy. The Israelites, they said all that the Lord have said we will do. They thought that holiness could be performed by themselves. They thought they could sanctify themselves. They thought they could perform, perform righteousness in their own ability. They thought all we had to do is keep these laws and it will, this will make us righteous. But to enter into God's rest, you must understand that holiness comes from God. So all the commandments, from the first to the tenth, they can only be kept by faith in Jesus Christ, the Lord of Sabbath, the one who creates all things, even the one who can recreate you into a new creature that can perform works of holiness, that please God, because now God is living in you. God is empowering you to will and to do of his good pleasure, according to Philippians 2 and verse 13. That's it. The commandment hasn't changed. And ladies and gentlemen, whether you like it or not, Sunday is the mark of the beast. Sunday is the mark of the beast. And when it is legislated as a day of worship, that is when people will have to make a decision whether they will hold fast to the commandments of God or they will fall for the theories of men. End of story. Finished. See, like exactly, somebody said keeping Sabbath wasn't an issue in the New Testament. You're right, it wasn't an issue because everybody knew what the Sabbath was. Even the Gentiles knew what the Sabbath was. It was never convoluted. During that time, everybody knew what the Sabbath was. So why would God have to deal with something that wasn't an issue? I mean, think about it. If I'm coming to work on your car, I'm not com if I'm coming to work on your car because your car is broken, right? If your car is broken, right? You say, you say, I got to check engine light on. If I start checking the tires on your car, you might question what type of mechanic I am because I come to your house. I, I, you know, you bring your car to me. You say, I got to check engine light. I didn't have a check tire pressure light. Why are you dealing with the tires? The tires are fine. I told you the tires are fine. The pressure is fine. These are new tires I just put on the car. They're fine. That's not an issue. We need to deal with what's broken. In the New Testament, the Sabbath wasn't an issue. Everybody knew what day the Sabbath was. It wasn't something that people had to deal with. Jesus didn't have to deal with that issue, but what he did have to deal with in relationship with, what he did have to deal with in relationship to the Sabbath, which you see here in Hebrews chapter four, was the issue that these things can only be kept by faith. And men have to realize that holiness stems from Jesus and not from within. Exactly. I mean, why God? I mean, it's absolutely ridiculous. That's why people talk to me like, why didn't Jesus talk a whole lot about the Sabbath in the New Testament? Because the people understood what the Sabbath was. You want to know why? Let me tell you what the problem was. They didn't understand the spirit of the law. These people understood what the letter of the law was and they added to the letter of the law. But what they didn't understand was the spirit of the law, ladies and gentlemen. And when it came to the Sabbath, Jesus actually was stripping away the false doctrines that they connected to the Sabbath and he was trying to teach them how to keep the Sabbath in the true spirit of the law. He said, wait a second, if your donkey falls in a ditch on the Sabbath, wouldn't you pull it out? You liar. Of course you would. So why shouldn't I heal on the Sabbath day? The only reason you'll pull a donkey out of the ditch on the Sabbath day is because you're trying to protect your own interest. You're selfish. I was going to use a word that Jesus uses in Hebrews chapter 12, but I ain't going to use it right now. <laughs> he said, you're selfish. He said, listen, the Sabbath is for good. The Sabbath is for good. That's why the Sabbath was made for man. It was made for our benefit. Remember, if the Sabbath means that the God is the one that sanctifies us, and the word sanctify means to be made holy, which means to be made whole, then why shouldn't Sabbath be used as a time to do healing? Real healing. 
healing that brings you to God. Because to be healed is to be made whole. Listen, you know what's interesting? Many of us, very of us who claim to be living under the new covenant and believe in grace and are against legalism, you don't even realize that you're a legalist. You don't even realize you're a legalist. Because in, a, in fighting against the Sabbath, you're fighting against the spirit of the law. In fighting against the Sabbath, and in, in, in fighting against the commandments of God and the necessity to keep them, you're actually fighting against the fact that God, through the gospel, has made available to us His spirit so that we can walk in compliance with His will. You're actually fighting against the truth. You don't even realize that you're a legalist. I'm just keeping it real and telling the truth. And so, ladies and gentlemen, there it is. I think we have hit the issue and we've hit it from the left, we've hit it from the right, we've hit it from up and down. And for everybody here that doesn't believe, you will believe when you see it. You will believe when you see it. And furthermore, I give everyone here that's right. You're so right, KSW48. Most people say, I believe in Ten Commandments. As soon as you say, oh, so you believe that you should have no other gods before you. Of course. You believe you shouldn't worship graven images. Of course. You believe you shouldn't commit adultery. Of course. You believe you shouldn't take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. Of course. Oh, so then, then you also believe in the seventh day Sabbath. Oh, well, no, God, done, God did away with the law. The law has been done away with. The law has been done. How all of a sudden the law gets done away with as soon as the fourth commandment comes up. But when we talk about all the other nine commandments, you're like, of course I believe in all of them. As soon as you talk about the fourth commandment, then the law has been done away with. I'm telling you. It's a fact. It's a fact. I've had the conversation. I, don't, I can't even tell you how many times over the last couple of years. All right? I deal with thousands of people all over the world and it's the same nonsensical response all the law has been done away with as soon as you get to the fourth commandment and Scott Yatta MCG I pray you care I pray you care because number one God cares about you and number two the Bible says blessed are those that keep his commandments that they may have right to the tree of life and enter into the gates into the city you better care you better care you better care. All right, everybody, so I'm done with this. If everybody understood, how about all my first timers in here that have understood the issue that has been presented, you see the logic in it. Most of all, you don't see the logic in it. You see the biblical foundations for the truths that we have talked about this morning. If you've understood it and it's been new to you, I invite you to put the letters N1, on, I'll put the letters, put N1 on the screen, put N1 on the screen, N1. This is the first time you've heard this, you understand it, it's been a blessing to you. You've learned something new and it is clear to you. Put N1 on the screen. I just want to acknowledge that. Just acknowledge everybody. Glad that you were able to see it. Angel Queen underscore one. Glad Amy 0482. Tyrese 13 glad. Rogue Force 50 glad. GP Lugu <laughs> glad. Um, who else? That's right, two commandments cover all ten. That is true. Trev's good. Don't understand. Okay. Got my mix. Good. I'd like to see my other people understand. Good. Good, 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 good. Josh 200 Cyber QTY. QUTY. Good. Glad that everybody's able to see and understand. Oh, I love what my friend just said. Jesus took it all to the cross. Worship him every day. Okay, my friend that just said Jesus took it all to the cross, worship him every day. Number one, you're right and you're wrong. You're right, worship Christ every day. True. You're wrong, Jesus took it all to the cross. Jesus did not take it all to the cross. What does it mean Jesus took it all to the cross? Are you saying that Jesus destroyed the commandments at the cross? By the way, I'm asking the question and I'm not doing it antagonistically so. I'm doing it for the purpose of opening up a conversation so that I can put something on the table. All right? So are you saying that Jesus destroyed the commandments at the cross? Is that what you're saying? He took all the commandments at the cross. 
person who said it. We ought to worship God every day. When we're dealing with the issue of Sabbath, by the way, we're not dealing with just worshiping Christ on the Sabbath. We're dealing with the fact that the Sabbath is the day that God set it, sanctified and set aside. He didn't sanctify and set, it, set aside every day. He only sanctified and set aside one day. Okay? Okay, good. Jesus fulfilled the commandments. Very good. I'm so glad that you made that statement. Okay, so let's look at Jesus fulfilled the commandments. How many of you were in here when I was in Tobago and we dealt with Jesus fulfilling the commandments in James chapter 5? How many of you were here for that one? If you were here for that one, say yes. Tap, take, say yes if you were here for that one. Remember when we dealt with that in, um, when I was in Tobago and we were dealt with Jesus fulfilled the law? Do you guys remember that? Remember what we learned? Remember that? Was, was, wasn't that an enlightening experience? <laughs> okay, let's deal with it. Let's deal with it. Let's deal with, let's deal with Jesus fulfilled the law. We're going, to look at, we're going to look at the scripture that said Jesus fulfilled the law. Okay, here it is. This is what Jesus says in James, Matthew chapter 5. Wow, wow, my, my screen is acting crazy, guys. Forgive me. Matthew chapter 5 and verse 17. Matthew chapter 5 and verse 17. It says, Think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. That's our scripture right here. Think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. Now, with the understanding that many are presenting, saying that, saying that Jesus fulfilled the law, basically what you're trying to say is that Jesus did away with the law. But now let's look at it in light of what Jesus just, just said there. He said, think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. I'm not come to destroy, but to fulfill. That, now if, you th if you're saying that Jesus did away with the commandments, then what you're saying when Jesus fulfilled the commandments, then what you're saying is that Jesus said, think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy, but to do away with. <laughs> that makes no sense. Think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy, but to destroy. Think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy, but to blot out. That's like me saying, Think not that I am come to destroy your house and your car and your land. I am not come to destroy your house, your car, and your land. I'm to, I, am come to, I have come to overthrow your house, your car, and your land. Does that make any sense? Anybody here, does that make any sense? Okay. So if you take it away, you're destroying it. You're doing away with it, right? Now. But by your unlearnedness. Okay. Now let's look at what the word fulfill means because as I as I as I said earlier it's so important that when we're studying the Bible that we one we first of all acknowledge the fact that words in the Bible can have several different meanings all right it can have one word can have several definitions and the way that we come to an understanding of how we are to proper properly define that word as it's being used in the scripture is the context in which the word is being used. Okay, so I'm going to take you to the website. I'm going to do exactly what I did the other time when I was in. Um, I definitely have faith. I believe that God is the one that saves us. I believe that he's the one that empowers us to keep his Lord. Christ is Lord. By the grace of God, I have faith. So we're going to look at this from the Strong's Concordance right now. Okay. Now with it. Here it is. Think not that I am come to destroy the law. Yeah, yeah, you need faith. The just shall live by faith. But what does it mean to live by faith? What does it mean to live by faith? The Bible says in Romans 10, 17, So then faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Faith, ladies and gentlemen, is established by the word of God. Faith is your belief in God. But your belief in God is to empower you to do the works of God. 
It's not just you walking around saying, I believe, and then you can go and slap and kill people. Your belief is supposed to be manifest in works. Belief is to be manifest in works. If your belief is not manifested in works, then your faith is vain. End of story. Look at the book of James chapter 2. So let's keep on going with this issue right now. Matthew 5, 17. Think not that I am come to, come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. Let's see what the word fulfill here means. So we're going to go here. Let's click on the word fulfill. This is what the word fulfill can mean. Paul preached grace. You are so right. We're going to talk about what grace means in a second. The word fulfill means to make full. Think not that I'm come to destroy the law of the prophets. I'm not come to destroy, but to make full. Okay. The word means to cause to abound. Think not that I'm come to destroy the law of the prophets. I'm not come to destroy, but to cause to abound. Think not that I'm come to destroy the law of the prophets. I'm come not to destroy, but to render full, to complete. Mm, okay. Let's look here. Let's just get right to it for the sake of time. Think not that I'm come to destroy the, the law of the prophets. I'm not come to destroy, but to perform, to execute. He didn't come to destroy the law of the prophets. He came to perform the law and the teachings of the prophets according to the true spirit of the law. Not according to man's teachings. He was tripping away from the law and the prophets, the teachings and commandments of men, and showing the true revelation of what the law and the prophets look like as they are performed through the life of a man that is controlled by the Spirit of God. He came not to destroy, but to perform the requirements of God in their truthfulness, in all true righteousness. That's all that is. All right, ladies and gentlemen, listen. I want to get into a long discussion right now, but what I can do is I can do a scope on grace um, in the next scope. I'll do the next scope. I'll do the next scope. The next scope, I'll do in grace. But for everybody that says, all you have to do is believe, and all you have to do is grace. Yes, the Sabbath is on Saturday. Jesus is the Sabbath. He took it to the cross. Jesus did not take the Sabbath to the cross. You're killing me. Oh, my Lord, have mercy. Okay. Everybody that wants me to deal with Jesus not taking the Sabbath to the cross right now, say yes. And I'll, and I'll deal with it really quick if I have to. I'm killing my voice right now. I can't do it. Because if I do this right now, I'm going to completely destroy myself. I'm going to completely destroy myself. I need to take a break. But listen, I love you guys. All right. I love you guys. And I will come back on here and I will deal with these issues again another time. All right. I will definitely do a scope on how to keep the Sabbath correctly. But listen, I love you guys. You can't consecrate anything. You really, you can make things holy. Then if you can make something holy, you're God. If you can make something holy, you're God. You can't sanctify anything. That's the end of the story. And I'm telling you something. Stop listening to the jumping up and down babbling of these preachers that are telling you this stuff. Prove what you're saying from the Bible. That's all you have to do. Prove all things. Hold fast to that which is good. And I will do my jewelry scope as well, Jules Jr. All right, so for that, for, for, for now, I have to end this. But I'm glad that we're all able to be on here. Glad that we're able to learn a lot of things. How many people are in here for the first time right now? Put the number one on the screen if this is your first time in here. Only God can sanctify. Amen, amen, amen. How many times this is your first time in here for the first time? Let me know. Put the number one on the screen. Just want to say, oh, man, thank you for being in here. Wonder good. Okay, Angel Queen, glad that you're here. John Scott, I'm glad that you're here. Rev2221, glad that you're here. I want to invite you to be followers here on Periscope, subscribers on YouTube. Sten68, glad that you're here. GP Hulugu, <laughs> glad that you're here. Definitely read Acts, brother, love it. Um, read Acts, matter of fact. What, 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 you guys are going to make me do... I, I want to go so much longer right now, but I won't do it for now. Thomas, glad that you're here for the first time. Everybody say welcome to all the first timers. You know how we do it. And um, for everybody that's in here for the first time, I want to invite you to be followers here on Periscope. And I want to invite you to, I want to invite you to be subscribers on the YouTube channel. This is the YouTube channel, the Forerunner 777. 
This is a docu-film that it put out not too long ago. Kevin McLean, glad that you're here. I want to invite you to um, check out this docu-film that I did on um, YouTube. Take a look at it. I believe that's 100% true. The law is the schoolmaster to bring us to Christ. You no doubt about it. The law proves to us that we cannot perform those deeds. We need someone to save us, and that's Jesus. You're so right. Um, so I uh, invite you to be a follower, a subscriber on YouTube. Okay. With Jesus' atonement, we're no longer required to keep the law. We are not on the law, but under grace. So you're no longer... So, so God says we should no longer keep the commandments? Are you sure about that? Okay. Just to debunk that, just real quick, for just real quick, just real quick, everybody, in a second. No, no, no. The law is not of faith. Trying to obtain righteousness by the law is not of faith. You're mixing the scripture up. Trying to obtain righteousness by the keeping of the law is not of faith. Keeping the law by faith in Christ operating in you to will and do of the pleasure of God. That is the grace of God working. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, that's it. We cannot mix up the truth. That's all I'm trying to say. Okay, let's get to this one here real quick. So somebody said we no longer have to keep the law anymore. Okay. Just show you a scripture. This is 1 John. This is no more New Testament than this, eh? 1 John 5 and verse 3. For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments. And his commandments are not grievous. They're not a burden. They're not a burden. That's what the word grievous means. They're not a burden. It's a pleasure by faith to do what is pleasing to God. Because he's our father. He loves us. He died to save us. And he's given us his spirit to lead us into all truth. For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments. And his commandments are not grievous. So either God is saying we're supposed to keep the commandments or not. According to 1 John 5 and verse 3, God said keep the commandments. If you love him, keep them. How? By faith. Realizing that you can't do it in yourself. You need to turn to God and ask him, Lord, I'm a broken man. I'm a messed up person. I want to be like you. Please give me your Holy Spirit so that I have the ability to do the things that are pleasing in your sight because I want you to be happy. I want to fulfill your joy. I want to live in harmony with your will. Because all these people say that we don't have to keep the law anymore. The same people that say that, all right? Make sure that you, the same people that say that, please, make, just put your address up here because I can send a couple, you know, send, just put your address, send me an email with your address because I still know a couple of people on the street that would run up in your house and steal everything from you. Will you see these people? I still know some people on the street that would love to run up in your house and steal everything from you. But they won't be stealing, right? Because they're not breaking the commandments. You, can, you can't get mad about that. If everybody says that we don't have to keep the law anymore, then don't get mad if, you, if your husband or your wife goes out and commits adultery on you because they don't have to keep the law. We're not under the law. Don't, they don't have to do that. You understand? No, no, no. I'm, my statement, and I'm, obviously I'm not going to do that. I'm, I'm making a very blunt... I'm, I'm, I'm speaking like this because I'm trying to make a point. Everybody knows that what I've just said is absolutely repulsive. It's repulsive. It doesn't make sense, right? It doesn't make sense. Of course stealing is breaking God's law. Of course committing adultery is breaking God's law. Of course covetousness is breaking God's law. We're not supposed to lie. That's breaking God's law. We're not supposed to kill. That's breaking God's law. Everybody knows that as a Christian. But as soon as you talk about the Sabbath, oh, the law has been done away with. We're not under the law anymore. All these things start coming out. You start knowing all these doctrines that are not even doctrines. They're actually commandments of men. They're false doctrines. They're the doctrines of the Nicolaitans. I'm trying to tell you, stop following the he say, she say, and go directly to the Bible. Exactly. I love what my friend just said. You will naturally keep 
the law when Christ is in you. Faith plus nothing equals salvation. You're absolutely right. You're absolutely right. But what does faith do? What does faith do? What does faith do? Okay, watch this, watch this. For my friend that says faith plus nothing equals salvation. What does faith look like? Matter of fact, who's the father of the faithful, my friend? Who's the father of the faithful, my friend? Who's the father of the faithful? Who said faith plus nothing? Faith plus nothing equals salvation. Who's the father of the faithful? Come on, let's be honest right now. Who's the father of the faithful? Okay, loving the body. Not just loving the body. Not just loving the body, my friend. Because Jesus says, bless them that curse you. Do good unto them that despitefully use you. It's easy to do good to other people that believe the way that you believe and are kind to you. True faith True expression of the love of God is how you deal with people that don't like you and how, how you deal with people that falsely accuse you, try to harm you, and slander you. That is the true expression of the love of God. And that's why through Jesus Christ making his way to the cross, we see the greatest expression of the love of God that any being has ever seen revealed before. Okay. Who's the father of the faithful, Kevin McLean? Who's the father of the faithful according to the Bible? Come on now. You already know who I'm talking. Okay, everybody else in here, if, if, if Kevin McLean doesn't want to answer, who's the father of the faithful in the Bible? Name his name. Come on now. Name his name. I'm sorry. I did not mean to stay on here so much longer, but this, this is very critical. This is so critical. There's only one person that knows who the father of the Okay, good. Abraham. 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 Very good. Abraham. Abraham. No, no, no. It's not Job. It's Abraham. All right? Abraham. Abraham. Now look what the Bible says about Abraham. All right? I want you to see this. Looking at the book of Romans. Looking at the book of Romans. I'm going to read this to you. Romans chapter 4. Romans chapter 4, looking at verse 19. I'm going to start verse 18 because I like 18. Romans 4 and verse 18. Who against, hoped, who against hope believed in hope that he might become the father of many nations according to that which was spoken. So shall thy seed be. Now look at this. And being not weak in faith, he considered not his own body now dead when he was about a hundred years old, neither yet the deadness of Sarah's womb. So look at this now. Look at this. God told Abraham, you're going to have the promised seed, Abraham. You're going to have a promised seed. Abraham got that promise to God for how many years? Right? Now Abraham... Hold on one second. That's the hot one, right? Immediately, immediately. It's bad for her. Abraham's the father of the faithful, right? So at a hundred years old, at a hundred years old, Abraham doesn't have a child yet. And his wife, my friend, my, his wife is around the same age. Her womb is dead and Abraham's seed is dead. Yet, he was strong in faith that God was going to provide him with the seed. Am I right? Yes or no? Yes or no here? Yes or no? Yes or no? Yes or no? I'm waiting for you guys to put yes or no on the screen. Yes, 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 yes. Now, ladies and gentlemen, here's my next question. Yeah, that was at one point. That was at one point, but then he moved forward. Now, watch this. How did Abraham's wife bear seed to him? Let me ask you a question. Did Abraham actually lay down with his wife? No. Let me put it like this. Did Abraham actually have intercourse with his wife? Yes or no? Did Abraham actually have intercourse with his wife? The answer is yes, he did. Because the Bible does not give us any idea that like Mary, Ab that like Mary, the Spirit of God just came upon Abraham's wife and she, beards, and she bore seed. Abraham had intercourse with his wife. Now, for Abraham to come together with his wife, both of them being old, her womb is dead, his seed is dead, but he's doing it because God tells him that he's going to have seed. What, did, what was that? That was an act of faith because, because logically they knew they could have as much intercourse as they wanted to 
ain't nothing coming of that except for two old people laying together. <laughs> but it was an act of faith. It was him saying, I know my seed is dead and I know my wife's womb is dead, but God said that it is us. It is me, it is us that are going to have this promised seed. It is us. And so, let's, let's do it, Sarah. One more time, let's do it. Let's do it because God said we're going to have the seed. Not because we can have a seed, because clearly your womb is dead, clearly my seed is dead, but if God says we're going to have a seed, then let's do it. <laughs> listen, listen, listen. Let's talk about faith and works. Let's look at something else if you don't believe that, all right? Let's look at it again. Let's look at this again. Go to Hebrews chapter 11. Go to Hebrews chapter 11. I want you to see something. Because the devil's trying to distract right now because I know some people are learning things right now that they haven't learned before. So I'm sorry, I'm sorry, for, the, I'm sorry for the trolls and the hecklers today. Usually I let y'all stay around, but right now y'all gotta go today because we're gonna finish this truth right now, okay? Listen to this. Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11. I want you to see what eat. I want you to see something. Hebrews chapter eleven. Let's look at. Let's look at verse seven. Hebrews eleven and verse seven. By faith, Noah, being warned of God of things not seen as yet, listen to this, moved with fear, prepared an ark to the saving of his house. Stop. Noah did what? The Bible said. By faith, Noah being warned of God, moved with fear. What did Noah's faith lead him to do? It led him to move. Did you see how Noah's faith led him to do action? And what was his action? His action was to comply with the commandment of God, which was Noah build an ark because there's a flood coming. Did Noah ever see an ark? <laughs> did, Noah, did Noah ever see a flood? No. Did Noah ever see water fall from the ground, fall from the sky? No. But Noah was warned of God that a flood would come. Noah was warned of God that rain was going to fall from the sky. Noah was warned of God that the world was going to be destroyed. And God gave him a commandment in conjunction with that warning. He said, Noah, I want you to build me an ark. And Noah said, Pfft. his actions of building an ark declared his faith and his belief that what God said concerning a flood coming upon planet Earth was a reality. Though it was not seen as of yet, he moved and did what God asked because he believed in the word of God. And guess what? Watch this. Who gave Noah the power to swing a hammer to build an ark? Who gave Noah the strength to cut down trees to build an ark? Who gave Noah the voice, the mind, the intelligence to preach for 120 years that a flood was coming? God, ladies and gentlemen. It's God that gives us the power to do the things that he commands us to do. That is faith revealed in works. And you can resist the message all you want, but that's all I got to give, give to you right now. It's a fact. It's just as simple as that. I'm just trying to make it simple. Okay? And that's the same thing that's the same thing that God requires of us. That's why the Bible, you know what? I got to close. I got to close. I got to close with one more scripture. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. You don't got to believe me, but you got to believe the Bible. Cuz I'm not I don't care about people believing me. Cuz I don't have any heaven or hell to put you in as we love to say. But it is it is imperative that you believe the word of God. Look at this. James chapter 2. Listen to this. James chapter 2. Got to read this scripture before I close it up. James chapter 2 and verse 17. Even so, if it ha even so, faith, if it hath not works, is dead being alone. According to the Bible, faith that is not revealed in works is a dead faith. That's the Bible. So you can say anything you want to. But anything that you say that is contrary to this is extra biblical.
It's not truth. You can't get any more New Testament than James, can you? Yea, a man may say, Thou hast faith, and I have works. Show me thy faith without thy works, and I will show thee my faith by my works. End of story. So for all of you here that say, I believe Jesus is coming, and, and I, I believe he's coming, then show me by your works. Go out there in the world and tell people Jesus is coming. Stop being a closet Christian. You say you believe Jesus is coming? Huh? You say you believe Jesus is coming? Instead of giving your tithe and offering only to the church, I want you to set aside a sacrificial offering for evangelism weekly so that the message can go to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. Show me your faith by your works. You say you believe Jesus is coming? When you come home from work and you're tired, take an hour nap, then get up and go and knock on your neighbor's door and go tell them about Jesus. Show me your faith by your works. Stop talking. You can tap on the screen, put hearts on the screen, and say, oh yeah, and throw the scripture up on the screen. You really believe? Show me your faith by your works. By their fruit. All right, everybody, we're done. I've done, I've done, took, I have completely destroyed my voice on this one, but it was worth the while. It was worth the while. And so praise God for that. All right, listen, God bless you for everybody. That's the first time that you've been in here. I invite you to uh, be a follower here on Periscope. I invite you to be a subscriber on YouTube. I invite you to be a follower on Facebook. I invite you. Listen, if you really believe that God is the provider and the sustainer, as he says in his word in the book, listen, it's right there. He says, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Seek first the kingdom of God. Do the work. If you really believe, do the work. Because everybody loves to jump up and shout, whether it's Sunday morning or Sabbath morning. Oh, but when, it's, when it comes time for you to actually strap the boots on and go and tell somebody, it's crickets. That's when you only see two, three people, four people, five people. When, when earlier, there was a whole church full of people. Oh, I'm hungry. Oh, I got something to do. I got this. You ain't got nothing to do. You're selfish and you're lazy. That's all you got to do. Be selfish and lazy. Stop lying. You don't have anything to do but be selfish and lazy. Let's be honest. Listen, just be honest with yourself and you can progress forward. If you're not honest with yourself, you can't progress forward. Let's just be honest. All right? Period. So, listen, for everybody that's new in here, first timers, I invite you to be a follower here um, on Periscope. I want you to be a follower here on Periscope. I invite you to be a follower here on Periscope. I invite you to be a subscriber to the YouTube channel. I definitely, definitely invite you to follow us on Twitter as well. Um, and definitely uh, send me messages via Twitter. You can send me an email at the number four then runner seven 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 at gmail gmail.com. The number four then runner seven 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 at gmail.com. You can send me an email there. If you have any questions, concerns, um, video requests, periscope topic requests, um, information that you'd love to share with me. Um, I appreciate all of those things. Thank you to everybody that does share information with me through these different avenues. I really do appreciate it. I want you to remember that the writings of Paul doesn't contradict the rest of the Bible. As Paul says, the spirit of the prophets are subject to the prophets and so all the prophets are speaking the same truth. Praise the Lord. Amen. Um, um, what else do I like to say? I'm looking forward to hopefully getting started with Leprevision Part 2 soon. Um, I encourage everybody out there to um, encourage other people, people to watch Leprevision Volume 1. Um, what else? You know what? If you want to support the Leopard Vision Project as well, if you do want to support the Leopard Vision Project as well, let me see something. Or, or, or just the Ministry of the Forerunner Chronicles if you want to. 
because we have some interesting evangelistic projects that we're working on for this year that I'm not talking about, but um, it's just because I want to get them going before I... I invite you to, uh, you can um, send a donation. Just you go into the Periscope description. That's the Periscope, my description on Periscope. There's a link that you can click on right there. Forerunner Chronicles to donate right there. And um, you can um, send a donation. All right? You can send a donation to the Forerunner Chronicles. This is a ministry that is established to, for the purpose this is a ministry that's established for the purpose of evangelizing all over the world and uh, taking the message everywhere possible. So if you'd like to donate, um, if you'd like to send love gifts and all of that other stuff, you can do so through, through that website. All right, everybody, I'm tired. I am so tired, but I hope to come back here again. Uh, the website again. Here's the web, oh man, I'm showing you everything about the website. There the website is, forerunnerchronicles.com. Forerunnerchronicles.com. You can look in my description for my Periscope. It's right there, you can just click on it. And that's the YouTube channel right there above it as well. So this is my Periscope description that I'm showing you. So even if you just swiped from left to right on your screen, you should be able to see the Periscope. Uh, you can take a picture of this if you want to, yeah. But um, if you swipe from left to right on your screen, you should be able to see this uh, description and uh, be able to utilize the information. All right, there it is, everybody. All right, that's it. God bless you, God bless you, God bless you, God bless you, God bless you. All right, so as always, this is the Forerunner. I'll see you guys later on this afternoon, God, God's willing. Who's singing in the background? That's my daughter singing. It's <laughs> my daughter singing in the background, sharpening up the vocal tunes over there, trying to get herself together. <laughs> so as always, this is a forerunner, and whether you like it or not, the truth is the truth. <laughs>